Thank you very much, Dr. Nalini, Madam, and also Dr. Akansha for this kind invitation, and Dr. Nalini for very impressive introduction. So, and good morning to everyone, all the colleagues, students, friends from MIT University, and also from the different parts of the world, and many places I see many names. So, it looks like that many of my friends they have also joined. So, welcome you guys here. So, uh, I, it's my privilege basically to share some of my, our ideas on this uh, on this lecture. And those of you who have been hearing me in the different talks, so this will be a little bit different. And because in my earlier talks, I was talking more about our science, our research activities. But here, when Amity University and Amity Institute of Organic Culture, uh, basically, Madam is the head of that department, institute. And Akansha, so they asked me to give a talk, which should be basically generic talk so that majority of the colleagues can follow. So what I've done that instead of having just research aspects, I'm talking a little bit philosophical aspect as well, that how we can use these modern approaches like genomics for nutrition and health. And those of you who follow the social media, they are most welcome to join me in the Twitter or in the Facebook page. And I will be talking in coming slide that what we are doing and what we need to do. So I think Shad, I got a little bit stuck now. So we in that now I cannot go to the next slide. Okay. okay. So yeah, so I'm coming from ICRISET. As Madam mentioned, ICRISET is for International Crop Research Institute for semi arid Tropic. And uh, in this case, let me just talk at this one, Shad. Okay. I'm just trying to fix some of this issue. Okay, yeah. So at ICRI said, we believe that all people have a right to nutritious food and a better livelihood. And our vision is a prosperous, food secure, and resilient dryland tropics. And in terms of that, our mission, our institute, together with its partners, are trying to work overcoming poverty and hunger, reducing malnutrition, preventing environmental degradation. And we are working cross-cutting areas, including empowerment of women, coping with climate change, digital agriculture, etc. And some of you may be knowing about uh, our institute, but if not, our headquarters here is in Hyderabad. We also have an office in Delhi, but we do not work only for India, but we are having our research operations, field facilities, offices in several parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, including Ethiopia, Kenya, Malawi, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, Niger, and Mali in the West Africa. So we are very much in the West Africa and also Eastern Southern Africa. And our research is basically helping more than 45 countries around the world where our crops are important. Now, in terms of our capabilities, we are having the multidisciplinary high class science. We are on the grounds in Asia and Africa. We have the strong networks and we use the participatory methods. And we can see that we have a big team for more than 1,000 people around the world. So they are working on all these different aspects. Now, in context of this talk, so we know that world is facing lots of challenges. And the current one challenge when we know about this COVID-19, this pandemic, this is also, this is a new challenge. We never had these kind of situation for last 100 years, the last time we had in 1918. But now after 102 years or so, the whole world is facing this problem. And any kind of problem when you have, then food is very, very important. So now from this aspect, if you see the world that how things have been moving, and you will be surprised that it took about 200,000 years of human society for the world to reach 1 billion population and only 200 years to reach 7 billion population. And now the funny thing is that in next 40 years, we will be adding another 2.8 million population. So basically what this figures or graphs you see, they are the logarithmic value. And we can also see that majority of the world population during the last few years happened in Asia and Africa. On the other hand, in Europe, you can see that this is going down. And uh, so uh, the, the same thing in the North America. Now, if you see this 2.8 billion population, majority of them, will be coming from sub-Saharan Africa and from Asia, et cetera, from the developed world, only limited number of those. So basically, this is going to be much more challenge 
in the case of developing countries even if you see from our country from india we have 1.3 billion population and you can see that well how this population is increasing so again we think that by 2050 we will be reaching about 10 billion population as i told earlier in 19th century we had 60 percent rate of growth in 20th century this was the worst we had 281 and in 21st we already are having 84% and this is counting. In India right now, we are having this second number, but in 2050, India will reach number one. Nigeria will become number third. So basically, we will be having more and more population. So now two things. One is we need to provide the food. And now if you see in terms of the food, even at the current, per, per, uh, current uh, stage, 821 million people, which means more than one in nine per, people of the world do not get enough food. This is not a good situation. And if you see in other countries, like a good continent wise, like in Africa, one in five person remain hungry. So, so this is the important or this is very serious concerns for all of us. And now you can see this world map that red is more serious, yellow is less, and this blue and yellow, blue color is not that serious problem. So, but anyway, so what, what I want to tell that we are having the serious concern of this not only that, on top of that, we are having the issue of the malnutrition, and I will talk about this one. So one thing is that for human body, you need all different components, not only the carbohydrate, you need the proteins, you need the fat, you need minerals, you need micronutrients, etc. India, good news is that we don't have the issue of the calories. In 1960s, we had this problem that we may not have enough food, but thanks to the Green Revolution. But now if you see the current stage, at the current scenario, protein remains a big challenge. And there are many news articles every day kind of thing that 80% of the Indians suffers protein deficiency. Nine of the 10 Indians diet uh, lacks protein. In fact, per capita consumption of the pulses was 60 grams per day in 1950s, but now this has come down to 38 grams per day, which is not good. So, and there are a number of reasons for that one. We will discuss what the point which I wanted to tell that we are having the serious issue of this protein. Now, how we can reach, how we can get this protein, you can have several sources of the proteins, of course, legumes, nuts, and also the poultry, dairy, etc. So there are different kinds of proteins one can get depending on their affordability. There sometimes there's also issue of our food habits, etc. And but there are the data that eating plant-based protein is associated with the lower risk of chronic diseases. So in the case, if you consider this particular point, then you can think over that, well, we need to go more for the plant-based proteins. And now the whole world is going in this direction. And therefore, agriculture, organic agriculture, etc., become very, very important. And I know that this is that institute's major objective to have the teaching and education research in that, in that direction. Not only that, if you will be using this plant-based protein, then they also save the carbon footprint and water footprint. So for instance, well, I will talk in this thing a bit more. I was talking about the proteins, but not only the proteins, we also have the issue of other nutrients, etc. And as a result of this malnutrition, malnutrition comes in the different flavors. And this I'm talking based on this, some data from the World Health Organization. Now, one issue is the child stunting, which is basically low height for the age. Another comp issue is child wasting, low weight for the height, child overweight, high weight for the height, adult overweight, micronutrient deficiency, basically anemia, adult obesity, etc. And nowadays there are many non-communicable diseases which are becoming the serious concern or serious factor for the death. And several of these things, you even do not need to go for the medicines, you can address those non-communicable diseases by having the good diet. And I will talk about this. Thing. So if you see around the world, we are having about 1.9 million people which are overweight and more than 600 million there for each. So not only we are talking about the undernutrition, we also are talking about the overnutrition. That's a different story that in majority of the developing countries, the funny thing is the developing countries, we have undernutrition as well as overnutrition. In the case of developed words, we are having majority of time overnutrition. But anyway, this is called malnutrition. So both under and overnutrition, they are considered malnutrition. Again, when you focus on the children under five, then 149 million they are stunted. 49 million, they have the wasting problem. 40 million, 
they are overweight. So this is the serious issue. Now, again, if you would like to go to the developing countries, like for instance, in Africa and Asia, you can see that stunting is happening more in Asia, 55%. In Africa, 39%. Then you talk about the Westing, then again, Asia is having 68%, Africa, 28%. If you see all these data, then Asian countries, and unfortunately, even our country like India, which is very, very advanced country as compared to many other countries doing great on many fronts. But if you see nutrition, then we still need to do a lot. So this is the serious issue that what we need to do. The other thing which, and why I'm talking all these things, because I would like to mention that how we can address some of these issues through food, through agriculture. That's one of the, my objectives. So I'm basically providing some information that what we need to do. Now, the other big issue is, and especially in the women and basically adolescent girls, anemia is very, very serious issue. And if you see that women from the 50 to 49 years, 51% are anemic and four in the 10 pregnant women, nearly 40% or about 32.4 million people are anemic. And we are having all these data, 243 million they live in India. So this is a big number. This is not a small number. Now, the other thing many of us nowadays, we are talking, we are serious about the diabetes. Again, and these are not basically the health related thing or so that for everything you need to go to the doctor. These are things because of our food habits. So for instance, if you see the type two diabetes, India and China, they are the major countries and USA is also coming in this number. You can see in India, we have 69.2 million people. They are suffering from this type two diabetes. Now, why this is happening, we can discuss in the detail, but I will not go at this stage, but rather what I would like to mention many of these things that are associated with your diet. And when you are having this diet, then depending on your genetics, that what kind of genes you are having and genes and environment interaction, and then each of us is having microbiota in our gut. So this gut microbiome also play a very, very important role in terms of the absorption of the different nutrients, in terms of creating that assimilation in body and also changing the metabolic pathways. So basically for all these things are important, but again, diet plays very, very important role. So in this context, and now another thing, majority of time when we ask or somebody asks, okay, tell us that which is the major problem for the death around the world? Majority of time we think high blood pressure or some people will say, well, air pollution, we know in Delhi or many other cities in India, that how much air quality index we have. Well, at least the positive side of the COVID-19 is that we got this air improved, which is okay. But nevertheless, if you see the different thing, even this drugs uses, et cetera, they are not the serious concern for the death. The first of the most important is basically dietary risk. They are number one cause for maximum diet deaths around the world. You believe it. And these are the data. So anyway, so what are the solutions? So we discuss a lot issue related to nutrition, related to the human health. Now the question is that how we can solve, what are the solutions? As I was telling earlier, I would like to highlight here that in all these things, basically, work and diet and nutrition, they are the key. Unhealthy diets, they are one of the leading cause of global malnutrition. What is this diet and nutrition? What we need to do? If you have a healthy diet, this can help to protect against malnutrition. Nowadays, again, in this current corona pandemic situation, many of us are no, knowing this thing that majority of time this depends on your immunity level. So for instance, sometimes even this coronavirus may, may you may be exposed to coronavirus, but if your immunity is not good, then you will have the symptoms. You may need to go to the for testing and hospital, etc. But if you got the good immunity, even virus has, you were exposed to virus, you may not have the symptoms and you will recover by yourself. So these are the issues that basically this depends that well, how good your diet is, how good your immune system is. And some of these things like related to this diet and nutrition, if you can address, if you are having the good diet, you can address several non-communicable diseases such as diabetes, heart diseases, stroke and cancer. And what healthy diet should have? This should include all the different things, including fruits, vegetables, legumes, nuts, whole grains, etc. But what is happening, unfortunately, in our country, in terms of the food, if you are living in North India, you can be given the rotis, paratha, etc. And you forget the other thing. If you are in Southern India, you will be having your plate filled with the rice, but then you will not have the dal. You will So, I mean, what I'm trying to say, you need to have the balanced diet. You need to have all these things together. 
and fruits and vegetables they also play very very important role and we need to work uh, in all these direction so now question to you is and many of us they do this thing and this is because of our changes in the food habit whenever we have these problems you can address those issues by taking these medicines majority of us who are living or who are enjoy, who are having this urban lifestyle we do it but the second question is you can get all these things from the food so if you can address or if you are having this balanced diet good diet you don't need to go to these things and i'm sure that majority of you would do would not like to go to this option this should be on the, the last option we should try to address these issues by this one so basically that's what i would like to mention that we need to do now you can ask the question that well so we, well i was saying that we need to ask the question and here is the big question and this is a big question that what we need to do should we continue to go to the doctors for all these things or we can now again this is the issue of this lockdown thing huh, that we are all many of us are not very happy with the lockdown but government had to do this lockdown because we did not have enough hospital we did not have even in a beds if you would have larger number of these people showing the symptoms where you will go we already have seen the cases of like italy and spain that we did not have the good medical infrastructure how many deaths we had so this is a big question that how you can address all these issues and i think that we need to work in this direction and one of the possible answer among the different thing is we need to diversify the establishment we just do not need to dependent on wheat we do not need to depend on just rice or meat or only one or two dal or one or two vegetables we need to bring this diversification on these things in this direction my institute and we have our colleague dr jona kane potaka and she is promoting this concept of smart food and our institute says that smart foods are very important for diet diversification for addressing the issue of the nutrition and health and what does it mean the diversification of the staple crops and the system in which they grow is essential to make future agriculture sustainable resilient and suitable for the local environment and soil those of you who are interested to read more about that please browse the site smart food initiative anyway the objective of our research and especially in my program what we are trying to do that we want to earlier we were using this agriculture mainly for the food now we would like to connect this agriculture not just for food but also with the health and the nutrition is our key so this is the thing that we need to go now in this direction now in this context if you would like to see that how this happened why this is happening again this is not very old if you see current scenario and again this is uh, like for instance how many plant species we have around the world which can be used as a food and this is coming from the world economic forum we are having at least 30000 plant species but if you ask the question that how many plant species are cultivated for food all over the world traditionally then there are just 7000 so you reduce larger number now if you say how many crops are grown on the commercial scale including spices beverages etc then this is only 170 so sad now if you see the crops that provide the world's most calories and nutrients they are just 30 and not only that funny thing is that even if you see this pyramid kind of a structure only three crops rice wheat and maize they provide 40 percent of our calories around the world not a good scenario we have the possibility to have 30,000. Unfortunately, because of our culture, our, our way of life, we move from 30,000 to 7,170, 33. Majority of us know that when we are in the laboratory, when we in the offices, instead of having the normal food, we would like to grab the burger or pizza or something, which is again not good for the health because again you are targeting on the food. And because of all these regions, if you see that how things have happened in terms of that going down, and going higher majority of these crops which were coming in this 30000 components 7000 components they have gone down sorghum india was used to be a very important country for sorghum sorghum production is going down i'm not talking india i'm talking around the world cassava millets many of these things the production is going down what is increasing now you can see sunflower oil palm oil soya bean wheat they are important but their overuse overthink is not really good and we all know that about the use or misuse of the oil or so anyway now you can ask does this matter yes it does matter because we knew that we need more for everything we would like to have the big cars big house everything we are talking more then 
Why you would like to focus only on this three and 30? Why you cannot go for more? We need to think in this thing. And especially when we have these evidences. So again, what I wanted to mention from this discussion that we would like to have diversity on the farm, diversity in the diets. We need to have the healthier diets. So this is, we need to move in this direction. Now, when I say the diversity in the diets, I'm not talking only about these five, six crops because we work at a reset. That's the reason I'm talking a little bit more. But as I was mentioning earlier, I was talking about that. You need to have the fruits, you need to have the vegetable, you need to have the different kind of thing. But nevertheless, coming back to a reset crop, that we work on the three cereal crops, and these are the sorghum, palm millet, finger millet, three legume crop, chickpea and pigeon pea and groundnut. And if you see that these kind of these thing, we are having the rich source of the protein, fiber, minerals, calcium, iron, and magnesium, and they have the higher amount of the protein, dietary fiber. We are having this digestible protein higher, and you are having all these micronutrients, calcium, magnesium, iron, and zinc, which you will not find in many like in crops like wheat. Or I'm not talking you should stop eating wheat. Okay, I'm not saying you should stop eating rice, but I'm talking that you need to bring this diversification in our diet. Now, some example, crops like palm millet, they have high amount of the iron and zinc. Crops like finger millet, they're having three times calcium. Now, like kodo millet, they are having high in the dietary fibers, three times more than wheat, three times more than maize, and 10 times more than rice. Palm millet, we are having two times more protein than millet. Millets, they are high antioxidants, they're gluten-free. Rice is having huge gluten. Now, people are working on rice, how you can make the gluten-free? Friends, millets are already gluten free. So you see, so these are the things that we need to work in this direction. Again, I will not go in the detail, but not only for the perspective of the food, even if you see from the environmental perspective, you know that crops like millets, they need less amount of waters and basically less amount of fertilizers on the pesticide. So you will be having very minimal carbon footprints, minimal water footprints and millets. And I have done research and we will discuss about it in a few minutes. Crop like permanent, they can survive even at the 42 degrees Celsius temperature where the crops like maize, wheat, rice, etc. You will not have the seed formation. So you can grow these things when we talk about the climate change. We need to see those perspectives, which crops will be surviving at that time point. You are having the higher yield potential. We have the multiple uses. So I was talking, promoting a lot about these crops. But one major issue with these crops is that the crop productivity is very, very low. And now the question is that how you can enhance this crop productivity, how you can make this thing much more attractive, etc. And for this purpose, purpose uh, crop community, breeding community, together with the different disciplines, have been using a range of the tools and technology. My background is in genomics, so I would like to share some of these things that how the genomics can help. Before we go to the genomics, let's talk about the genome. And this is like a genome kind of thing. So what is the genome? So genome is basically total amount of the DNA or genetic material or hereditary material of represent or which represent a cell or an organ. And in all these things, you have the smaller, smaller component of the DNA and we call them genes. And these are the genes basically, they, they, they code the different traits and they are responsible for making plant different type, the human being different type, immune system different kind different so basically each and everything is controlled by the gene so now when we are talking about the human health and human health is very very important around the world you see that no other country could have the lockdown if you are having the other issues but when people realize that this is having the impact on the health more than 140 countries are having the issue and people started to go for lockdown completely locked down why because health is very very important for everybody now, if you would like to go from this perspective, way back in 1990s, when we started to understand the structure of the DNA in 1953, but then we started to have some advances in the technology. Then scientific community ask, some people are having cancer, some people are having this particular issue or so, and everything is controlled by genes. Can we understand the genome architecture of the human genome? And based on these things, can we develop the medicine? This is called genomic medicines. So with this perspective, what they did that they started to sequence the human genome and they took about 13 years and they had the investment about $3 billion and they were successful to sequence this human genome and this provide a lot of information and this has really revolutionized the pharmaceutical companies. Now the question is, can we afford to sequence more genomes in $3 billion? No. Then we started talk. 
can we make the sequencing cost affordable? Can we reach the sequencing of a human genome for about only just $100 instead of time for 30 years? Can we do this thing in just half an hour so that you can have this genomes thing related like those kind of things like personalized medicine that even you just go to the physician and you have the possibility even they can sequence the genome, they can figure it out which gene is having which kind of nucleotide variation, what are the issues? So like those kind of things, still we need to go a long way in this direction, but nevertheless, scientific community around the world is trying to work in this direction and they came up with the different kind of sequencing technology. Now we are having very next generation sequencing technology, third generation sequencing technology. They're very, very cost effective and you can generate huge amount of the data very quickly. And why this is required? Again, in the context of this corona pandemic, many of you may be knowing and all of us are waiting now for basically vaccines. And this will be the first time that vaccine development will be at so fast pace. Why? Because in that as soon as we had the issue of the corona and when people from China, from United States, from many countries, when they sequence the genomes and now you are having the sequence for more than 1500 different isolates, etc. So this is happening that very nicely. And what happened that when you are having this, like this is the genome sequence of Corona and now, which, yeah, so NCOV2, but anyway, so that what you can do that you can understand these different genes. You can understand that what protein they code. You can understand that well, which gene is responsible for causing which protein and which is making this virus basically attaching to the human cell and then degrading it and then inside going in that human cell and then making control over that one and they starting doing the RNA replication. So based on all these things, people go, wow, I need to bring this change in that one and I need to bring this change and then what kind of molecule I should have. So based on all these things, we started to go for about this human medicine and vaccine, etc. And now we already know that people are working. Hopefully we should have these. Well, they say that vaccines are already available now, but they are going for the testing. Let's hope that we should have this solution of these things very soon. And anyway, so this was that. So what I want you to tell that based on these gene sequence, you can figure it out the issues related to health. Now, if you go in the plant system, in agriculture, basically, in agriculture also, you can do the similar kind of thing. So basically, once you have the gene sequence of any plant, you can identify and you know that these plant crop species, they are also exposed to a number of diseases. They're also issue with the productivity. They also have the issue with the pest resistance. So the question is, you can identify those genes that which gene provide that resistance to this disease which gene will be good for higher productivity pest resistance etc in not only that one we can also think we can also talk about the genes related to environmental stresses nutrition sustainability and when you get these information you can use them in the crowd right so you can develop the better varieties so that you can have this good thing so with this perspective Many colleagues around the world are working and even at ICRISAT, we have the center of excellence in genomics and systems biology. We started this thing way back in 2007. Now for last more than 12, 13 years, we have been working on similar aspect. We have been sequencing the genomes of the different crops and not only that one crop or one, one genome of one variety or so, now we are sequencing thousands of the genomes and how we are doing, making it possible, we got the advanced sequencing technology, different kind. You can see some of this picture. We would like to invite you to visit our center whenever you are in Hyderabad or so. But anyway, you can generate this huge amount of the sequencing data, but to make the sense, you need to go. You need to do the sophisticated analysis. You need to understand the genome. You need to understand the genes. You need to understand the prediction of those genes. And for doing, we also have the high performance computational analysis system, which is having about 600 cores, 830 terabyte storage, 7.5 terabyte RAMs. And then based on all these things, we have been working on all these different aspects. And I will discuss some of these things. I cannot cover everything, but good news is that majority of this work has already been published anyway. So what I want to tell that crops like pigeon pea, I remember I mentioned about pigeon pea, chickpea, palmillet, groundnut. So what we did during last few years, we have sequenced the genomes of each of these species. And we already have sequenced the genomes for more than nine crops to get at here at Ecreset and in the partnership with the different partners around the world, including Sesame, Mongween, Ajukivin, Jatropa, etc. And not only that, but the sequencing the genome. Now we are going at large scale. So, for instance, in the case of chickpea, we sequenced a set of 400 lines, in pigeon pea, another set of 300 lines, 
And now in the case of chickpea, we have more than 20,000 accessions, 20,000 lines. We already initiated sequencing of them. We already completed sequencing of about 3,000 lines. So this is the way that you can use these machines. You can do these things. Now you can ask the question, well, Rajiv, are you doing these things just for fun or is it any application? Friends, remember I was telling about the pulmillet earlier and I was saying that pulmillet, that this can survive even at the 42 degrees Celsius and crops like rice, maize, wheat, they don't have even the flower seed formation, seed setting there. Why? Based on the genome sequence of this pulmillet, this is penicetum glaucum, this is pulmillet, this is rice, this is barley, this is maize, and this is the different crops. When we did the analysis of this pulmillet genome with the different genome, we figured it out. Pulmillet genome is having a specialized set of the genes, about 384 expanded gene family from vaccine biosynthesis pathway. And we have done all these analysis. We found that these kind of genes, they are present only in pulmillet, not in other crops. Now, the question is, the crops like wheat, maize, and rice, which are important crop for the world, when you cannot have this survival of those crops at 42 degrees Celsius, then you can use these genes coming from the pulmillet and you can improve them even in this wheat, maize, or rice. So, I mean, what I'm trying to say that coming genes coming from one crop, you can be used them in the other crops. Same thing in the case of pigeon pea, for instance. Pigeon pea is the Tugur dal, Arhar dal used with the different names. And we sequence the genomes of this pigeon pea way back in 2011 or 12. Soybean is important crop. Around the world, people know about soybean, not pigeon pea. But then there was one group in UK and also United States, and they talked to me, Rajiv, you are working on pigeon pea, and soybean crop is closely related to pigeon pea. But soybean is having an issue of the Asian soybean trust, and this is a disease. And they did not have the natural variation, the resistance in soybean for this disease. But what they did, that they used our pigeon pea genome and they used one gene from pigeon pea and they were successfully, they were successful to develop resistant line for Asian soybean rust. And even this published the paper also, and you can see here, a pigeon pea gene confers resistance. So you see the genes coming from pigeon pea, they're helping soybean. And this is the beauty to have this sequencing data or so that not only for one crop, you can work on the other crop as well. Anyway, when you get these gene sequences, now the question is, you need to associate them with the strain. Now, for instance, this is a chickpea. This is a larger seed. This is a smaller seed. Now, how will I know that which gene is associated with the seed size? And for that, there is a, you need to set up some experiment. You need to develop some population, like this is parent one, parent two. And then you have this population. When you have this population, the genomic segment disaggregate. And when you have this segregating population, we do the gene analysis and then try to identify, oh, let me see which segment is associated with larger seed size. Now you can see that wherever you have this blue color segment is associated with large seed size. When you are having this brown color or red color, this is smaller seed size. So this means the genes present in this blue color thing, they are associated with the seed size. Same thing, here you got six different lines for the height. This is a pigeon pea, smaller height. This is pigeon pea, larger height. Now, when you sequence these different lines and you find, wow, a nucleotide at this stage is associated, is always present in larger, taller plant. T nucleotide is present in a smaller plant. So basically, this mutation, this A nucleotide is associated with the higher taller plant. This T is associated with the shorter taller plant. So based on these things, and this is called trait mapping, basically, that how you are mapping a trait like. I would like to say disease resistance. I would like to say flood tolerant. I would like to say drought tolerant. All these traits, and then you can associate them with the genes or so. So because of this region, so for instance, that when you are having these different crops like rice, got 37,000 genes, chickpea got 28,000 genes, maize got 32,000 genes. Now we need to associate these genes that out of 28,269 genes, which gene is associated with that trait? And for that, we use this kind of approach. And after that, we do the trade mapping. And in summary, in our crops, in chickpea, groundnut, and pigeon pea, we have been successful to map several traits, up to 20 to 50 traits, like drought tolerance, heat tolerance, salinity tolerance, leaf rust, et cetera, in each of these crops. So we have been successful. So basically, after having the genome sequencing, having the phenotyping, you can associate with that. Now, the next question is, how you develop the better varieties? 
I will not go in the details because this is a little bit technical. One, one thing which I would like to mention that now the breeding process is like that one. You take good variety, another good variety, make the cross. When you have the progeny, you put them in the field, the line which is good, you can take to the next generation, then you have another next generation. But this takes six to eight years depending on the but if you got the gene association information, gene information associated with these different traits, and you say, oh, this is a drought tolerant variety, this is the salinity tolerant variety. Now you make the cross, you do not need to put everything in the field. If you have the gene associated with drought, associated with salinity tolerant, you can just screen the population in the laboratory and you can say, wow, you need to go only for this line and this line, and you just need to advance this generation. So by doing these process, we call the monocrop breeding, genomics assisted breeding, and we develop the better line. So this is the way that we can keep on moving in this direction. Now, by using the genomics assisted breeding, we have developed several lines and I'm telling some success story, like in the case of Ethiopia, the first variety of chickpea from the molecular breeding, and this was developed in the background of JG11. And this is now the highly drought tolerant variety is having higher yield than the normal variety. So this is one good news. Similarly, in the case of chickpea, my friend and good collaborator, Dr. Bhardwaj, it up from IRI, from where Akansha has done her PhD. So Bhardwaj did this work and he introgressed this drought tolerance segment in Pusa 372 line and developed the next version. And this variety through monocrop breeding was also released last year in India. So you got this variety. Now the other variety, chickpea, which is called fusurum wilt sensitive, which was the susceptible for fusurum wilt. Annegri was developed way back in 1980s became susceptible for fissure weight, but now Dr. Mannur and now other colleagues from US uh, uh, Raichur, like Dr. Lakshman and Dr. Yeri. So together with them, we developed the new lines called Super and Negri, and they got the resistance than other, uh, the traditional variety. So you can develop this kind of thing. Now, very quickly about this nutrition related thing, health related thing, if you see groundnut, and groundnut is a basically oil seed crop. If you see the groundnut oil composition, then you can see that this is having palmitic acid, linoleic acid, and oleic acid. Oleic acid is good for health. Linoleic acid is not good for health, but majority of the groundnut varieties, they are having this high linoleic acid because this is the polysaturated fatty acid. Some varieties like sun oleic in United States variety, you can see here you've got more than 80-90% of the oleic acid, only very less amount of linoleic acid. The question is, why some varieties are like that, some varieties like this thing, and based on the genome information, metabolic pathways, we had the information that which genes are responsible for converting this linoleic acid and oleic acid or so, and by using this information through the molecular breeding, what we did, we converted this kind of line in this kind of varieties, and you can see now, majority of these lines, they are having more than 80% oleic acid, and in India, a director of groundnut research, Last year, they released two varieties, Granar 4 and Granar 5, and this is the first set of the high olic variety. So basically, this is coming from the nutrition. Now, so you can use these molecular breeding approaches to enhance the production, enhance the nutrition. Now, very quick thing is, we were talking about this protein deficiency in India. So what is happening that in one person, basically, we need to have about 52 gram protein per day. But right now, we are having this per capita consumption, just 38 grams per day. Now, if you see the protein, like in dals or so, this pulses, generally you are having the 20% of the protein. So if you are taking 100 gram or 10 gram, or depending the family or so, if you are taking 100 grams dal, the whole family, then this is just 20 grams is going in the side you or so. But now, if you can enhance the protein content in these dals, like from 20%, you can reach 30%, 40%, then with the same amount of the pulses, you can have higher percent of the protein inside your body or you should take higher amount of the protein, dal. And what you can do, you can enhance the crop productivity so that you can have, you can afford more dal. But at the same time, if you are having higher protein content, then the larger amount of the protein content will, will go in your body. And with this perspective, this is an example of chickpea. In chickpea, generally, we have the 20% protein content. Now, based on some of our phenotyping of about 3,000 lines, we got some lines which are having even up to more than 30% protein content. You can see that 16 lines that are having more than 30%. Now the question is, these lines, they don't have the higher productivity, but we have some variety which have higher productivity, but if we can find the genes which are having for this higher protein product content, we can transfer these things from here to those lines and we can have 
higher productivity, we can have higher protein content. So this is the way that we can move. And now I would like, so this was about the pulses and those things related to this agriculture. Now very quickly in just four or five minutes, I would like to touch another important point. I was talking about this uh, thing that, well, not only that what you are eating the diet, but most important thing is that what kind of gut microbiome you have inside your body and how this can impact on your health. And for this purpose, at ICRIS and our Systems Biology Research Initiative, we are working with different partners. We have initiated some project on iron deficiency that can be addressed the issue of the iron deficiency, severe acute malnutrition or type 2 diabetes by using this agriculture. And I would just like to mention very briefly, and we are having this project together with the National Institute of Nutrition of Indian Council of Medical Research, and of course, with the different partners of ICRISAT. So what we are having that if you see that some girls, and if they are, and especially this unfortunate situation, that if they are not coming from the good family background or something, or even with the good family background also, if you are having the enemy and this adolescent girls, and if somehow they get married at early stage, because in some culture, this may be possible, and unfortunately, if they become mother at early stage, then what will happen that these girls, when they are anemic girls, they also carry this microbiome, which is not good, but then this, and this microbiome is also transmitted to the children. And then the children, they are also having the malnutrition. So basically, this vicious cycle keeps on moving. Now the question is, can we address the issue that when the girls, they are adolescent, at that time point, we do some interventions and we make them basically address the issue of anemia, we provide more iron to them, and for this perspective, what we did that at said together with our cross, we had the high iron fulmillate, high iron peanut. So we developed a chicky fulmillate and peanut bar and we started to have an experiment that we can work on this aspect. So what we did that we initiated this project together with NIN and we had, we called this FIPA project, Iron for Adolescent Girls. And here, what we are doing that in these states or wherever we have the issue of this iron anemia, what government do, they provide them iron folic acid tablets. So what we thought, let's understand first that what kind of gut micromodulation we have when girls are provided iron folic acid. Second is we are also providing the another group, peanut and palmillate chicky because they are also having the high amount of iron. Let's see that what kind of gut microbiota health changes we are having. Do we have some correlation based on these things can be recommend to the government that instead of having this high iron folic acid tablet can be address the issue with this peanut and palmate bar. And based on this thing, we initiated this, uh, ex, this uh, project in Telangana in welfare hostels and where we got the three groups of the girls, 60 girls, they were mild, 60 were moderate, 60 were healthy. And NIN colleagues, they took all these testing, blood samples, sociodemography, dietary history, anthropology, all these things. And what we did that we started to have these experiment that we started to provide those iron folic acid and we, on the other project we provided with, yeah, so in this thing, iron folic acid, and then as a set of these three months experiment or so, we have collected the fecal samples, blood samples, and now we are trying to analyze this microbiome so that we can see that what kind of impact we are having. And this is a really very successful project. In the other project, in the same way, when we had these three different groups of the girls, we have provided them the chickies instead of iron folic acid thing, and this was developed here. And now we are also doing this all these analysis. So basically, we would like to understand that what kind of changes we are having, and can we recommend a particular microbiome that if you need to address the issue of anemia or so. So this is a very successful project, and you can see that many of my colleagues uh, from Ikrisat and uh, I, NIN they have been working with these girls hostel, and this was and we need to see these results in coming months or so. The other project which we are doing, and this is related to basically understanding the effect of finger millet based dietary supplementation, because I was talking, they're having higher diet, uh, dietary fibers. And we think that this is required for addressing the issue of the acute malnutrition. The other thing is the severe malnutrition. And here we are working with NIN, with Trivendra Medical College, and also with the Society for Health and Demographic Surveillance in West Bengal. So basically, we are going to the community and we are trying to address this issue. Lastly, we are having one project together with All India Institute of Medical Sciences here with Dr. Rama Chaudhary and Dr. Deepak Bemula. And here we are trying to work with them because they are interested in the type 2 diabetes. And we are trying to understand that if gut microbiota plays some role in this thing and what kind of microbial biomarkers can be developed in Indian population. So I can, 
So what I'm trying to say, so we are trying to address the issue of these nutrition, et cetera, through agriculture. So not only for the food, we are talking about this health. We are talking about these non-communicable diseases. And my feeling is we can address all these issues, not all, majority of the issues, or we can make some contribution in this direction. So in my opinion, I would like to summarize my presentation now that agriculture is a key for a sustainable solution towards healthier diets and reducing burden of non-communicable diseases, dietary diversification, including whole grains, legumes, fresh fruit, and vegetable. Guys, should not think that I'm just promoting at crops. I'm talking about the diversification. This can come from anything, right? And as I said, the genomics can play important role. They can enhance the products and they can enhance the productivity. At the same time, they can also make some impact on those nutrition traits. And molecular plant breeding, Techniques can help in transition from a nutrition relevant to nutrition sensitive agronomy. And we need to understand the role of gut microbiome so that we can correct those diets. And this, so basically these diets, they are crucial for curbing malnutrition and non-communicable diseases. And the human gut microbiota function is not only critical for nutrient absorption from the food, but also maintaining overall health. So this is the thing that we need to think in this direction. And at Ecrease at our center, we have been working with large number of partners. We feel very proud and privileged that we are having the partnerships with more than 180 partners from 35 countries in six different continents. And this, I have not presented majority of the research work what we are doing. As I told that majority of you have been listening those scientific talks in other webinars or in other conferences, but this was a little bit different and I wanted to share those things. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you once again to MIT Institute of Organic Culture, Nalini Madam and Akansha. And again, those of you who are in the social media, they are most welcome to follow me in the Twitter and also on the Facebook page. Thank you very much. And uh, I will be happy to take up some question. First question, um, first is a comment by Mm, a student that uh, thank you so much for this and uh, now the, uh, there's a question that the problem of protein malnutrition several decades back problem will it continue for next decade also or what specific solution we would apply for eradication of malnutrition okay very good question so i think this is the issue now and what we need to do that as i said that according to the icmr recommendation we need to have the 52 gram proteins per day and we are having right now the issue thing is only 32, 36 and majority of the people they are not having and two reasons for that. One is that protein is expensive. People are not able to afford. And for that, what we need to do, we need to enhance the production so that we need to bring it in affordable thing. And the genomic science can do it. Second is, as I told that even if you are having the 20% protein content, instead of 20, you can bring it to the 30%. Then with the less amount, you can eat more, have more protein. So this is that uh, one thing in my opinion that we need to do. Right, sir. Uh, there's another comment by Dr. Nandlal Chaudhary. He said, very nice presentation, sir. My question that is, India has natural diversity and able to grow different type of food crop to meet the nutritional requirement. But why majority of Indians, specifically rural, suffer from nutrient deficiency? Don't you think because of commercializations, uh, the farmer are moving uh, to high value crops rather than local crops? Absolutely. And this is the thing that we need to address through the policy or policy changes or so. But now, like Government of India, MS Swaminathan Research Foundation, many organizations, they're already talking about this food basket that we should have these different kind of diversified crops there. And what he's saying, Dr. Yeah, so this is very important. And the similar kind of thing happened when we had this white revolution in terms of the milk that many times smallholder farmers, they are having the cows, buffaloes. They are having the milk, but their children, they are not having that milk for their, their consumption. Rather, they are selling this milk for the other people. So we need to see a lot of issues, the social status and different things. But now what we need to do, uh, like even like Rajasthan, Haryana, etc. Earlier, we used to have a lot of millets consumption or so. But now because of this urban culture, because of the different things, people think, hey, my neighbor is eating rice and I'm still eating bajra roti. Why I need to eat bajra roti? So I mean, those kind of things we forget that well bajra roti is having a lot of important thing now what is happening madam that urban society is going back to the millet based food now we are talking right. etc on the other hand our colleagues in this in villages or in the rural areas they are completely dependent on wheat and rice so they are having just carbohydrate that's good but then they need to have the other thing as well 
So there are a lot of <laughs> lot of things can be addressed through the policy changes. And I know that Ministry of Agriculture and my institute, they work very closely. We have our colleague, Dr. Arvind Padi, and he's sitting on several panels. So he also uh, basically promoting these kind of things in that government circuit. So we need to see this. Right, sir. And with this, I think you have already answered is another question uh, which uh, in which he has commented that issue is income rather than availability, availability of protein rich food. So, yes, we have socioeconomic factors also playing a role. There's another question from Ramya Selvi and to all the panelists. Hello, sir. What is the kernel size of Girnar 4 and 5 groundnut variety when compared to the bold kernel size variety? Okay, so then what we did that, that in this particular variety, we just wanted to introgress and Introgress the high olive thing. So we took the variety that I do not remember the name, the lines, which had the optimal size of the kernel grain. So you are having the different kind of the gold one, the normal one. So here we have just introgressed the trade. So those varieties, they have the high olive, but we can introgress this, this trade in this bold kernel size as well. And now our institute, directorate of groundnut research, US Dharwad, many organizations in India, we are moving in this direction. Good question. There is another question by Dr. Sangeeta Pandey. She is saying that thank you so much sir, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, and uh, sir, you said that microbiome of the gut is important for overall well-being. Similarly, microbiome of the rhizosphere, the rhizosphere of crop is equally important. Does Icarisite work on the microbiome of crop rhizosphere and their role in improving the quality and productivity of crops? Very good question. Yes, we are working and I have not put this thing here because this presentation was on the human health and nutrition. And we are working with the Hyderabad Central University and also Indian Agriculture Research Institute. My colleague Lekha, she is having some projects on this aspect. And in the case of chickpea, we are working on the microbiome. So now this is the time that microbiome either in the plants or microbiome in the human. And these are very important to address the issue of the productivity, nutrients, and et cetera. So I think we need to work in this direction. And we are working. Yeah, thank you. Right, so there are many of the comments which is uh, actually basically praising you for your wonderful presentations. I'm not reading them out. You can read them through the chat box. Uh, there's another question which I am uh, putting up by Deepa Bhagat. How insect pest genome sequencing help? So yes, this is also important thing. We have, at Ikri said we are not doing in the insect, but we have done some project on the pathogen genome sequencing, like fusarium wind. Is it fusarium? Oxyspurum sacerai is a causal organ for fusion wilt in chickpea. My colleague Mamta Sharma and in collaboration with different partners. So she has collection of more than 100 isolates. What we did, we sequenced all these things. And after that, we can figure it out that which pathogen is high virulent, which is low virulent, and then what kind of factors you are having. And if you are having higher virulence, can we understand the host pathogen interaction? So like in the of chickpea, we cannot breed for that pathogen, but we can definitely breed the new chickpea variety that we should have this kind of variety so that even if you have the virulent strain, this should not be uh, causing the disease to chickpea. So this really helps a lot. Right. Thank you, sir. Uh, there's another question, sir. Can you please tell us about the implications of genomics and medical sciences by Manish Nan? <laughs> so, well, I'm not a medical scientist, but I am working now with many, many medical science community. But what I can tell that all these things, what we are talking now in agriculture, basically all the genomics application started in the human. As I told that first we had the human genome sequence decoded. And after that human genome sequence, this has bring the revolutionary revolution in the pharmaceutical industry. So based on these, that which is the causal gene now for that related to cancer, diabetes, etc. They understand that which nucleotide you are having and then if you have this nucleotide, what kind of metabolic pathways you are changing and then to address that one, which drug you should have so that this cannot continue to in that direction so that disease should not happen. So in fact, in the human science, and they are called personalized medicine, and genomics is playing very, very important role. And now some people even call, call them genomic medicine. So now I gave example of this NCOV2. Now after the genome sequencing of corona, we have moving now towards in the direction of the vaccine. So genomics, again, genes, when you have the genes, you can address the issue. And in human genome, this is very Right, so there is one question by Sachin Kumar. Is this program connected to Harvest Plus? 
So not our not this one, but then there is some other program at Ecrisat. They are connected to Harvest Plus, and Harvest Plus objective is just to enhance basically that iron and zinc in the crops. I was talking a little bit different that if you are having this high iron and zinc related uh, these food crops, whether they are making the impact. And my opinion, Harvest Plus, Agriculture for Nutrition and Health, those kind of programs, they should really move in this direction, and we will be very happy to be associated with them to work with them. And this is the requirement right now. How to convince conventional breeders that genomics is the only way in future to enhance genetic gains? Well, I will not say that genomics is the only way, but rather I will say genomics is one of the important way to bring this thing in that uh, in that uh, uh, to enhance the genetic gains. You need to show this thing to the breeders, and as they say, seeing is believing. And I gave this example of the Fujiram wilt chickpea varieties, Dr. Mannu. And just before his retirement, two, three years before his retirement, and he was working with me from University of Agriculture Sciences, Raichur, great breeder. He came to me with the similar aspect. Rajiv, you say genes can do everything. And I have this variety, Annegri variety. I bred this thing in 1980s. Now this became susceptible. Can you help with this variety? And I can tell you, madam, that these breeders, they treat their varieties like their children. And then we say, oh, we will do it. And then we did this work. This Dr. Mannu, and once when we caught this variety and this was in the field, he was very emotional and he told me, and then by that time he was retired, he told Rajiv, you know what? I never saw the DNA by my eyes in my life. I say, well, you cannot see DNA by your eyes. But anyway, he was giving this thing thing. But now I'm very happy to see a variety coming from these DNA markers in my field. So a traditional breeder, a conventional breeder was very excited, very happy, and he was the one now to promote everywhere. So what I say, we should not just keep on talking, talking. We need to deliver. So basically, seeing is believing when the breeders will see the value. And if these breeders, they are really open-minded. Huh? Sometimes breeders, if they are not open-minded, even if they will see, they will close their eyes, we cannot help. But seeing right. is believing, right. they need to work in this direction. Right. So I think you've already answered the question of genopic improvement in vegetable crop by your example that you've just given. And now there's another uh, question by uh, Krishnanda Ingle. Uh, what gene sequencing uh, should be preferred for gene expression analysis or study in finger millet in case of abiotic stress condition as no finger millet genome sequences have yet been reported? Yeah, so finger millet genome has not been reported yet, but some colleagues of mine under my so my program itself, my colleague Damaris Odini, she is sitting in Africa, she is part of my program. And what she has done, that's together with University of Georgia and other part programs, they already have sequenced the genome of finger millet and will be coming very soon. And uh, as this question is about abiotic stresses, yes, we should have the different variety, resistant, susceptible, and then the art harvest the tissue sequence them and try to identify the genes so this is possible so just wait for the genome sequence but if you have the data you would like to analyze i can help uh, to connect you with damaris and she will be very happy to work all right so there's another question uh, i think a lot of questions can we introduce genes from lower organism like algae which are thermophilic uh, into our plants Yes, we can do it. And for that, there is an approach called genetic engineering. We call them GMOs, etc. And now, for instance, like in the case of many of you may be aware about this BT cotton. And this BT cotton, this BT genes has come from the bacteria. So you do these kind of things. And uh, there are many success stories around the world, even in India. But then some people, they have the concerns. And I think, madam, you are coming from the Institute of Organic Culture. You may not be very happy about that, right? <laughs> No, 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 sir. We are also very open-minded and uh, we are running various programs, undergraduate and postgraduate in agriculture sciences, not only organic agriculture. So I would like to thank you, uh, Professor Vashne, once again for joining us. And I think you can, uh, you know, view the questions, 44 questions uh, we have in our uh, uh, kitty right now and a lot of chat messages congratulating you and the people who are feeling proud that the kind of work you are doing uh, as a scientist in Ikrisat. So these are the comments that we have received. Thank you so much sir for joining us and enlightening our students and i hope that in future the collaboration uh, with you if uh, with the amity institute of organic agriculture can continue thank you so much for joining with us and sharing your views thank you i would like to take this opportunity to thank you madam to your team akansha for and all of you for organizing this thing and i always enjoy to discuss with different colleagues to share that knowledge information what we have and again once again thanks to all the participants who joined 
and sorry that we could not address all the question but nevertheless as i said we'll be happy to answer those things offline or through other platform but again thanks a lot madam once again for this invitation and we look forward to working with your mit university with your institute we will be very happy to collaborate with you and also with any participant who if they are interested to work on some particular area thank you very much and have a great day ahead uh -huh.